All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Agnes. I'm super excited to be here. And I'm an iOS developer uh, at PlanGrid in San Francisco. And I'll be talking about all the layout today. So we are going to look at the auto layout engine, its role in the rendering process, and then later on we'll see how it solves constraints with the Cassavary algorithm. And so now that you had lunch and you're all about to fall asleep, I think it's a perfect time to do some math. <laughs> uh, but first of all, I wanted to ask you a question. How many of you think that auto layout is complicated? Okay, half, half of the people here. Okay, so I'm hoping to, to prove the opposite today. So first of all, I wanted to share some about like what my initial inspiration was for putting this talk together. And it was a session at WWDC last year that I was lucky enough to attend in person where the presenters uh, talked about all the layout performance and then shared some about the internals, which got me very excited because I find that the more I understand about how my tools work, the better I can work with them. So what we'll do today is after a quick refresher of how the rendering process actually works, we're going to break down the key statements of this WWDC talk regarding auto layout performance and then We'll, look, we'll do that by looking at the very low levels, math, uh, to understand why those facts are actually true. So first of all, let's look at what we know about rendering views in a layout. So you know all about constraints, and then you know that at some point there are things getting displayed on screen. Uh, so we could, we could say constraints are the what going into this, this process, and then the displayed content is a result of this process, but what do we know about the how in between? And so I wanted to, to model it this way. Um, these are three components. Like first of all, it's, it's you, the developer, providing the constraints, and then there's auto layout in the middle, and then there's a render loop, which auto layout in some ways part of, and then it, it gets with the help of the render loop, things get rendered on screen and so the user can, can look at it. And the user, through adaptivity, can change things around, like imagine things like rotating a device or like typing in something that would change the layout, essentially. And so that kind of circles back to auto layout and auto layout and the render loop will do things that we'll uh, go a bit deeper into soon uh, in order to uh, render the new layout to the user. So as a user, what you see is like a smooth experience, right? So looking into the first part of this phase, it's uh, the first of these three phases is a developer's input, which is, we kind of said like it's constrained. So when you're thinking about what your input is through auto layout is that you want to, as a developer, you want to create satisfiable, non-ambiguous layouts, right? Which many people find difficult to do. And what you're essentially doing there is providing the size and position of all content in your layout by defining constraints, either by writing code or using interface builder. And so, talking about the other side of, of this um, process, there is a render loop, and the render loop has, the render loop is the thing that's running potentially up to 120 times a second, so it's something that, that runs many, many times, and it is what is making sure that the user always sees, well, the user <laughs> always sees uh, the up-to-date layout and the up-to-date content. And so the, the three phases of this render loop is like first, constraints, um, and then once the constraints are resolved, they get into the layout, and then once uh, we get a final layout, uh, we can actually draw the content on screen. Um, so 
I, I showed you the, those function names, like don't, don't bother trying to remember them. It's just like there are some UIKit functions that you might be familiar with and I just like wanted to classify like which uh, phase, which event belongs to which phase, but we'll like, I'll show you the, the more important ones uh, soon. So we are going to talk about these two phases. So um, part of this whole process under these two phases is one of, one of the, the players here is auto layout engine. So when trying to think about where the auto layout engine is, uh, I'll show you that we have an application window or we might have more application windows actually as you could learn from Paul this morning. Um, for a window, a window can hold on to views and the window also holds on to an auto layout engine instance. So what happens when you define constraints that you define for views, these constraints are get it, getting added to the auto layout engine in the form of equations. So equations have variables in them, right? And you get those variables from the view. And so in some ways, the view and the auto layout engine is communicating to each other to, for the view to understand where it has to be laid out to. So looking at this communication between them, how it works is the view asks the auto layout engine, like, hey, what are the values for this frame? And then the auto layout engine would send, like, give the, back the values and then store them in the meantime, which is very important. And what is also important is that if there is a value that was changed, the auto layout engine can notify the view to actually, like, on the next render pass, to make it copy the new values from auto layout engine back to the view. So it is always up to date. And these are the two function names I wanted to show you because this mechanism of letting the view know that on the next render pass, it actually has to like copy these values back from the engine to the view is a set needs layout. And so that's in a, a second phase. And then layout subuse is the event when these values are getting copied back. So, so this is very important that we mentioned that the, the all layout engine is storing the values and it can notify the views. So this, this quote from Ken Ferry was one of the presenters of this high performance all layout session I, I, I showed you previously. Um, he said the engine is a layout cache and dependency tracker so this is a very important thing to understand that this just means that auto layout performs well. And um, it's because what we've seen that it stores the values. And so you can imagine the render pass happening like many times a second. And then auto layout engine does not have to recalculate everything, just the things that changed. So it's a, it's a performance uh, gain. So I mentioned we are going to go through the key facts uh, from that uh, auto layout session from DubDub. And so these are the key facts. Don't, don't worry if you don't understand them now because we are going to break these down one by one. And then um, the, the goal of the talk is to, to understand why they are true. So they said the auto layout, uh, layout performance scales linearly in independent views and then constraint inequalities, even though you think these are some exotic things, they are not expensive. Error minimization has a cost. Error minimization is, uh, is what happening, is the problem that all layout engine is solving when you're doing uh, priorities with the constraints, when you're using priorities. And so they also mentioned that the constraint solver algorithm that they're using uh, in auto layout is the simplex algorithm. And so when I saw all these facts uh, at DubDub and I saw the name of the algorithm, I was like, you know what, maybe if I looked at the algorithm and looked at the facts, I can just connect these dots together and just like see it for myself. Like, okay, why, why is the performance of all the layouts so great? Why constraint inequalities are not too expensive? So that's what we are going to look at today. First of all, let me tell you how I actually ended up learning about this algorithm because I was obviously lazy and I didn't start reading it right away, or even though I got excited about this uh, dub dub session. 
So I joined this awesome company called Prangrid last summer, and I quickly got involved to all kinds of company events, and one of them is called Plangrid Papers. It's a paper club. So we read a paper and then meet up once a week, and it's a one-hour session, and we just like discuss the paper. So besides joking, I think many people think that academic papers are for like, I don't know, like students maybe, uh, studying at university. But actually, I learned many, many interesting things just by going there every other time, because you can learn about how, like, you can learn about the engineering behind even the most recent um, technologies we are using. Like the other week, I think we were reading about how um, HomePod recognizes the Hey Siri face. So, very uh, interesting stuff. So when I joined this club, I, I told them, uh, okay, I went to this DubDub session, I think it would be interesting to read about this simplex algorithm because it's behind all the layout, how cool is that? So they said like, yes, vote it, let's do it. And then I found out that if you pick the paper, you have to lead the session. So I ended up solving linear equations on paper for a whole weekend. Um, but I think it was worth it. Um, and the paper I was uh, reading and later on we discussed is called Cassavary from 1997. And the connection between simplex, because I've, I've been using the simplex and Cassavary words, um, Cassavary is a more uh, specialized version of simplex. So simplex is a linear programming uh, problem solver algorithm from the 1940s. So it's like a very old thing. You can imagine this is not something super complicated to do with computers today. And so Cassavary is like almost the same thing, it's just more specialized to usage and UI applications for constraint solving. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And so the reason why it's, uh, so the difference between Cassavary and Simplex is what we are gaining all the, the performance from is the fact that this algorithm is incremental and optimized. So what does that mean? If you're looking at this, um, this orange ball and try to imagine how would you like implement it with auto layout, like animating the constants of a constraints or something, you could say, oh, so like on every render pass, which happens a lot because you, you've seen how smooth this animation is, auto layout has to like recalculate everything from scratch. So the answer is no, and that's why this incrementalism is great because they're, like, the algorithm is designed in a way that it doesn't have to um, recalculate everything from, from, from scratch when there is a, a slight change to the, to the values. And these changes are being adding, removing, or editing uh, constraints, so these are all uh, not expensive, uh, and also the fact that we are solving similar problems repeatedly. So if you think about like what the problem we are solving, we are solving the problem of rent, like laying out the orange ball here and then one point next to it. So it's it's these are very similar problems to solve. So what the point here is is good performance. So I mentioned linear programming. What is linear programming? It's uh, maximizing of minimizing or minimizing of a model. You can think about companies trying to maximize profit or minimize costs or whatever. That's what the, the type of thing people use this for. And you describe your goal and in the form of an objective function and your requirements uh, in the form of linear equations or inequalities. So this is like pretty close to what we are trying to do here. You can think of, we can model the constraint solving problem as a linear programming problem because we have an objective function. We're trying to minimize distance, like think about inequalities or, or error if you think about priorities. And so constraints are our requirements and we express them in a the form of linear equations or inequalities. So going deeper into constraint solving, uh, we are going to, we're going to see a very simple, basic example. Here you can see like these two views. There are like three constraints up there, super easy. And I'll like for this whole talk, I'll, I will only be talking about horizontal coordinates. So like only axis to just simplify the problem. And so let me 
just substitute in a few numbers. Let's say like A should be 15 points from its super view or whatever is to the left, and then it's like 30 points wide and 10 from, from B. So if we wanted to express where B starts, so what is the min x of, of B, we would say something like, okay, we have x A being 15, we have the width of A, and we have the padding between the two. So B's min x is like 15 plus 30 plus 10, which is, if my math is correct, uh, 55. So this is like super straightforward, right? And this is what the auto layout engine is doing sometimes. Obviously, there are like more complicated uh, examples. And then I wanted to switch up and, uh, and show you a, a tiny bit more complicated example just, to, just so we can use the Cassavary algorithm to, to figure this out. So here, I, I'm losing the views. We are just focusing on points and x coordinates. And we are saying there are three points. Uh, there's one in the middle, there's one on the left, and one on the right. And we have this order to these points. We are saying that the left point should be less than or equal to the middle point, and the middle point should be less than or equal to the right point. So also, the left point should be greater or equal to zero, and then the right point should be 100 tops. And to just make it more interesting, we'll add these two other constraints. The first one is saying that left and right points are at least 10 points from each other. And the middle point is actually in the middle. So distance between left and middle and middle and right are the same. So let's uh, try to solve it with Castleberry. And so Castleberry um, <coughs> has a few steps, and they all have fancy names. So let me just uh, try to rephrase these names to like more uh, meaningful words. So first of all, we are going to transform what constraints we had, we listed, to a so-called augmented simplex form. And what it actually means is just a few steps of converting these, uh, these constraints into something that we can actually solve. And the second is to reach a so-called basic feasible solved form that I call uh, the step of cleanup. And then um, third is actually uh, a zero effort step. We'll get a solution at that point, which is going to be a good enough solution. And then the, the last point is when we reach the best solution. So first of all, augmented simplex form, very um, <coughs> fancy name for just like shuffling things around. Uh, we are going to convert the inequalities we have to equalities. And then we are going to separate out constraints with possibly uh, negative variables from uh, definitely not possibly negative variables. And the reason for doing that is the simplex algorithm that Cassavary is building on can only work with um, constraints or like equalities working with uh, non-negative variables. So first step, let's convert to equalities. So we are going to do that by adding a slack variable so if you look at the line at xl, left, x left plus 10 is less than or equal to xr. So we can say that xl plus 10 plus something equals to xr. So that, that is what this slack variable is there for. It just like represents the space. So we can um, make it an equation. Same with uh, this line. And then we're going to list these two being greater than or equal to 0 as a requirement here. And then the next step is identifying the objective function. So what are we trying to do here? We are trying to minimize the distance between the middle point and the left point. And when we are getting to that solution, when we are going to get a value for this objective function, we we'll also get values for the points. So we'll like solve everything at once. So this is our linear programming problem. And um, looking at the next step, we're going to separate uh, these things out, the, the possibly negative from like positive things. And it's, it also has some fancy names. It's called unrestricted constraints, the ones that could have possibly negative variables. And then the other, the other part is going to be the simplex. So we're going to do this separation 
visually by using this horizontal separator line and say like whatever uh, equation that has a possibly negative variable, we just move it up to CU. So we'll start with this row, XR's row, and if you look at Y, if you look at the bottom line, you can see like there are things that we stated that they're supposed to be greater than or equal to zero, but not XR is not there. So it could technically be negative. So what we're doing here is express it for XR. So it's like a um, simplified equation. And then find the next candidate for potentially moving it up. And then we can look at the bottom line and not see XM there, the middle point. So the next step is substituting back um, XR into whatever occurrences it has in other equations, and then moving up XM. I promise it will be over soon. So <laughs> once we moved up XM, we're just going to divide both uh, sides of it by two to simplify it, and then we get this ugly thing. And then we look at the objective function, and you can see that XM is actually in the objective function. So what we're going to do is substitute XM back in. And so we get a very ugly objective function. And so we are done with this step because there is nothing left in CS that could be potentially negative variable. So we are moving to the basic feasible solved form. So what that means is that we, we have equations in a certain form. So we have our equations in a form of having the variable on the left-hand side expressed um, with an expression on the right-hand side that has a constant and then a bunch of other things. And then we will call that the, the variable on the left-hand side, basic, and then all the rest, uh, the rest of the variables on the right-hand side, parameters. And one thing is to, that's a rule that x on the left-hand side cannot show up in any other equations. So we'll just look at what we have right now and see whether we are in the basic feasible solved form. And we will see that we are in that because if you look at xm, xr, and s1, they don't show up anywhere else. Whatever is in CS, that is S1, uh, the constant is positive, so we check all the boxes. And then the next step is lose all the parametric variables, and then we actually get to a solution. So we have numbers, and then we have the objective function, and we have numbers to substitute back into the objective function, and that leads us to 50. So when looking at it visually, we'll see like, okay, we got a good enough solution because if you look at the constraints, this actually satisfies uh, all of the constraints. So, we, so remember that the objective function was the distance between the middle and the left. So that's 50 now. And left is, x left is at zero, m middle is in the, in the middle, and right is at 100. So if you, if you can see what we were doing here, it's actually not a minimization, it was like the maximum possible distance that we, that we came to. So there's definitely some optimization to do here. And this is our very last tab. So the optimization part is finding adjacent feasi basic feasible solved forms. So we are just gonna shuffle things around um, to make the value of the objective function decrease. And so if you look at this objective function um, and you think about how to make the value of it uh, decrease, you can say like, oh, why not make XL's value something big? So if you think about um, like substituting back something like 200 into XL, you, you get like obviously something uh, that's less than what we have right now if XL is zero as we had previously. So what we are gonna do is swap out XL with S1, because this is the, the pivoting step. And so what we, what we are going to do next is substitute XL back in, because it showed up in XM and also shows up in the objective function. So we get finally something like simple. And this makes XL basic. So we are in a basic feasible solved form. And now we can get to our um, optimum solution, which is if we substitute things back in, we'll see it's a five. So looking at the visual representation of, of these points now, we can see that 
the distance is the bare minimum because we originally had the constraint to, to for x left and x right to be at least 10 point from uh, each other so like you can get below that and m is in the middle all of them are greater than zero and uh, less than or equal to 100 so we just solved these uh, these constraints and it wasn't even that complicated right so maybe like following it this quickly is not too easy but if you look at it yourself and you have a bit more time going through it uh, this is something we just like did with our hands so it's really not complicated just a few steps and that's what I like about auto layout that I actually understand what it's doing I mean I know that math can be scary but if you think about like how simple the foundations are of like of auto layout like the work it's doing is just math it's not there's no like black magic under the hood that many people imagine I think and it also helps like if you understand this concept like how simple it is under the hood I think it helps you um, create these satisfiable non-ambiguous layouts because you understand what it's doing and also regarding performance um, I'm like me as a developer I'm able to trust all layouts performance and I know how to not mess it up so for instance uh, in this dubbed up DC talk which is high recommend uh, Ken Ferry mentions that many people churn constraints so what it means is that in the if implement the update constraints uh, function and then in that you you constantly like remove all your constraints and we add all your constraints because for some reason you think that's how it should be done because you you want like you want to like refresh the constraints it actually is a performance hit because um, adding constraints for instance we, we've seen that the incrementalism helps with making it a not expensive step so if you think about how would you add constraints to whatever we just uh, went through here you have the table of the equations and then you would add this additional constraint and then convert like again convert to this augmented simplex form and then substitute this new new constraint in using the the current table that you have and then reach the basic feasible solve form and there you go you have your solution so we can see that the real deal is the incrementalism so the algorithm doesn't have to start from scratch you just add the new constraint shuffle a few things around and it's done so when you remove and re-add all your constraints 100 times a second in the render loop you can imagine like how like this 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 amazing uh, algorithm that's so simple down there and it has it was designed to help you with these kind of features as incrementalism you just throw it out the window so like obviously will slow your layout rendering down same goes for removing constraints so if you um, if you think about how would you remove constraints from from uh, let's say the final step and we had the equations up you could think like oh hey but like the constraint I'm trying to remove is does not exist in the original form of it when we actually added it first so it's very clever that the implementations of Cassavary add the marker variable just to keep track of the original constraint so when you're whenever it's trying to remove a constraint it will not look at the, the actual equation it will look at the marker variable and identify the original constraint and then just shuffle things around until this marker is on the left hand side as a basic parameter uh, sorry basic variable which means it does not show up in other equations and all those rules and it's great because you can just cross it off right so I think it's really straightforward and the only thing that's not straightforward is uh, handling constraints priorities so if you think about the mathematical problem that we just went through um, when you think about priorities being uh, high or low priority constraints uh, the way uh, it's modeled in math is that weights gets added, uh, weights get added to these constraints so let's say uh, high priorities like 750 and low priorities 200 
250 or something. These all show up in the math, and then uh, what's happening here is that it makes the objective function nonlinear, and the problem with that is it's just not as easy to solve as what we see in here. So um, in these cases, there is a so-called quasi-linear optimization step uh, that I'm definitely not going to tell you how it works because I, I read it, but I did not understand it. So it's a bit more difficult. And because of that, you can imagine that this takes a little bit more time uh, for all the way out to figure out if you're using lots of constraint priorities. So looking back at what we wanted to understand before uh, going into the constraint solving part, first of all, we wanted to see if performance scales linearly in independent views. So I think it's a check, because if you think about having these three points in a totally different view, in the same layout, what is going to happen is that it will take um, two times uh, the original to solve for all the layout. And so that's why we can say that if these constraints are in independent views, the performance scales linearly. And uh, inequalities are not expensive. We, can, we could see why, because whenever you have an inequality, you can actually convert it to an equality by just adding one extra variable. So pretty straightforward, not, definitely not expensive. And then what we're not going into in details is that the error minimization, that is the constraint priority problem, has a cost because it's just mathematically a more difficult thing to do. So a final takeaway from today and uh, from Ken's talk at DubDub is that you don't pay for what you don't use with auto layout. And I think once you understand that how it works under the hood and you, and you understand how amazing it is that this is a very targeted, efficient mechanism. Uh, but at the same time, it has very simple foundations under the hood. I think you'll, you'll realize uh, that this is a very advanced tool. And uh, you can actually uh, gain a lot of performance from, from using it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Agnes. We have a couple of questions. Okay. Mm. Ooh, table view cell. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Let me let me check the question. Okay. Dynamic heights. Oh, oh, these are like very specific questions to auto layout in marzipan. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, no, because there's auto layout. So the question is, are you expecting any change in auto layout with marzipan? Uh, I don't think so. Like Paul raised that question, but so auto layout is running on the Mac, right? It's Mac OS and iOS. So I think I kind of expect some um, limitations first, but I think it, they will not like change the fundamentals of how auto layout works as of today. Um, how does caching work for table view cells? This is, this is not this is not auto layout really. <laughs> Would it be possible to implement an auto layout variant that does not run on the main thread? I mean, I don't think the engine is running on the main thread. Like, like you see that these are like, it's like pretty low level math. And the only like interference with, with uh, the actual UI kit level happens when, when the, the values are copied back uh, from the engine to the view. So maybe this wasn't a question. Yeah. but. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be around. I'm happy to talk about this. And I'm also, this is my Twitter. My DMs are open if you wanted to talk about all the way out at any time. And I'll share some resources with my slides. So, thank you. Okay.